Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming. It's my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest today, Kristen Dykstra. She's an award-winning translator who specializes in translating contemporary Cuban poetry. Kristen does have Illinois connections. She used to be an Illinois resident, actually, when she held a full professorship in the English department at Illinois State University. She's now visiting us from Vermont, where she's distinguished scholar in residence at St. Michael's College. Kristen has translated <coughs> Reina Maria Rodriguez's Time's Arrest, Violet Island, and other poems, and other letters to Milena, as well as Omar Perez's Did You Hear About the Fighting Cat and Something of the Sacred. Remarkably, 2016 is her hat trick year. She's bringing out three books in 2016. It's quite a feat. They include Counterpunch and other horizontal poems by Juan Carlos Flores, Breach of Trust by Angel Escobar, and The World is Presence by Marcelo Morales. And some of you might have had the pleasure of hearing Marcelo read when he came to um, Chicago in this past spring. Kristen's translations of contemporary Cuban literature are published in bilingual editions that feature her own critical introductions and accompanying essays. Uh, her outstanding work has been recognized by a National Endowment for the Arts Translation Fellowship and a Gulf Coast Prize in Translation. She co-edited for 10 years uh, the journal Mandorla, New Writing from the Americas, Nueva Escritura de las Americas, um, from 2004 to 2014, with Gabriel Bernard Granados and Roberto Tejada. And I have to say that Mandorla was a fascinating instantiation of what a hemispheric poetics might look like. It was based in Illinois, Texas, and uh, Mexico, and was a collaborative effort between Latin American writers of all different aesthetic inclinations and Latino writers and non-Latino writers. It systematically presented writing in Spanish with no English translation, in English with no Spanish translation, and in all kinds of code switching modes and Spanglish as well. To my mind, Kristen and her co-editors succeeded in really constituting an archive with the journal Mandorla and a forum and a genealogy and a conversation that was really hemispheric. I want to say a quick word about the art of translation and the translator as an artist. In one essay, uh, Kristen has called translation, quote, ideally a site of intersection between human minds. She has a tremendous ability to create idiosyncratic voices across the poetry that she translates, and a gift for rendering lean, muscled language in memorable lines. When she translates a poem from Reina Maria Rodriguez into English, it becomes a new poem in English. Rodriguez's poem in English, also known as Kristen's translation, takes on a new parallel life that coexists with the original. Work by translators such as Kristen goes a significant distance toward unseating biases that linger con concerning the creativity and originality of translation and the gendered logic by which translation has long been understood as a secondary activity, so reproductive rather than productive. Kristen's work of translation clearly constitutes a creative practice through which she produces new texts. Uh, the U Transpo, which is a creative translation collective that I'm involved with, has recently written that unbeknownst to some of them, all writers are translators and all translators are also writers. Kristen Dykstra is certainly one such translator who is also a writer. Her translation work is also a form of activism, particularly as she has chosen to focus on the work of Cuban writers whose poetry, written under a variety of embargoes, both political and cultural, literal and metaphorical, might not otherwise reach an English-speaking audience. Uh, when she visited my class, Poetry of the Americas, this afternoon, she said eloquently, and I, I wrote it down, I hope I got it right, um, translation is a zone of asymmetries, accents, and incompletions. Her current projects include translations of work by Alvaro Mutis from Colombia and Amanda Berenguer from Uruguay. With Kent Johnson, she is co-editor of Materia Prima, an anthology dedicated to Berenguer, which will be coming uh, out with Ugly Duckling Press soon. Please join me in giving her a very warm Chicago welcome. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who made this night possible. I, I want to extend not only my thanks, but I've been talking with Reina Maria Rodriguez, who was supposed to be here with me. She sends her thanks afterwards. I can talk a little bit more about her um, uh, and, and not being able to come this time. But um, please know that she wanted very much to be here and hopes to be able to come in the future. So on her behalf, I am also saying thank you for um, creating this event. Now, since we 
don't have, Reina, we um, have been talking, I restructured it to do something that would be complementary so when hopefully Reina comes back in the future, it would not duplicate but would rather complement uh, a future visit from her. And with that in mind, I've shifted the focus of the reading. All of the translations that Rachel is talking about, these were the first book length translations of those authors into English, and that is also true for Angel Escobar, Juan Carlos Flores, and Marcela Morales. So I'm used to getting up in front of the room and people having no idea who I am talking about. And because of that, I have learned that I should do things like bring in photographs and audio recordings. I actually am going to play Reina reading a poem for you so you can really hear her and the sound of her voice and her presence. Same for Juan Carlos Flores. I, I videotaped him in uh, Alamar in 2010. So um, unfortunately, Escobar was deceased when I came to his work, so there was no such opportunity to do that. But I do have photographs from one of his friends he was very close with during his lifetime. So I, what I would like to do is give you a, a small amount of context, but not too much, because this is really a creative reading um, focused on experiencing the writing and not the critical side of the conversation. Before that, I have to have a little literary fan moment. I just want to point out that Yoss is here, okay? He's here. Welcome. Thank you for coming. This is one of the most important sci-fi writers out there and quite amazing. And he has a fabulous interview with Jacqueline Loss up in Bomb very recently. I just think if you have any interest at all uh, in this area, you should say hello. And um, <laughs> I, I will tell you never once when I imagined staging this event did I imagine that he would be sitting here in the room with us. So um, thank you. That's really wonderful that, you are, that you're here. So I'm going to start out with uh, a little bit of a framing. Since when you say three Cuban poets, you immediately put nation in the center of the rubric, uh, I would like to bring in a voice. Francisco Moran and I were emailing last spring after he had seen some of these books and looked at the poets who are being represented by the University of Alabama Press in this set. These are the first Cuban um, collections that they have done. Francisco was very interested in the way that these poets actually problematize nation, even as they are now being called upon to represent it. And he had this beautiful quotation that I think is a good starting place. Um, and I include Jose Cosar because even though I didn't translate Jose's book, he, his will be one of the next books coming out in this group. And Francisco wrote, they are not great poets to build on national discourses. As a matter of fact, they inhabit, in my view, a marginal space in regard to nation. Whether they are or aren't in Cuba, they are diasporic voices. This is not to say they are not political voices, too, for they are. However, they are political in the sense that Rancière sees it. Literature falls on the political, for it is the space of dissensus. It points to gaps and wounds where national identity dreams of a whole united nation. Sometimes in the United States, when people come to a Cuban literary <coughs> event, they have uh, certain expectations that the poetry will give voice to a certain kind of politics or a kind of rhetoric. And these poets really resist doing that. So um, I think Francisco's starting point is, is a good place. And Francisco not only is a wonderful scholar of Cuban literature, he has also been dedicated to poetry for a long time and, and knows these writers, right? knew them in Havana. So I will start with Reina. I have been working with her for about 20 years at this point. Um, she is known uh, for more than just her own writing. She is also uh, an organizer and a mentor to a lot of writers. And that has been a, a reality of the translation process for me because through Reina, with whom I began, I was referred to other people. I met other people. I learned a bit about the poetry community. Um, I heard people talking to me about why I should translate Escobar. And people who have very, very different aesthetics um, all claim Escobar as one of the most important voices um, of recent Cuban poetry. I heard over and over again about Juan Carlos Flores. So these are some of the reasons that I chose uh, to do these collections. 
Just to give you a little bit of a sense of Reina's preeminence in world letters, I'm going to very rapidly go through just a small number of the prizes that she has won, just to give you a little bit of uh, a sense of um, she, her, she has a very active still uh, po publishing career today, predominantly coming into things through poetry, but she also does intergenre writing essays and novels. Um, she has two Casa de las Americas awards for poetry, both from the 20th century, um, won a major award in 2002, won the National Literature Prize uh, a couple of years ago, which occasioned her a certain amount of stress um, <laughs> representing the nation in this respect, and then won the Pablo Neruda Prize, which for those who are unfamiliar with it, it's awarded in Chile. It is one of the um, major prizes in um, Spanish language poetry and carries a cash prize as well, um, which uh, makes it a very coveted prize. And her cultural activism really comes to the fore in the 1990s during what's called the special period in Cuba, which is the, during the realignments following the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, that's when she began to use her home as a gathering space uh, for artists and writers to come together and be able to talk about their work with a uh, critical perspective. She still today is trying to do some of that. She has a small press that publishes tiny press editions, but she is spending a fair amount of time outside the island now. So um, she's uh, interested in topics such as diaspora and displacement, even as she has long been associated with not only a specific neighborhood, but a particular block and a particular apartment building um, where she still has family. Her mother is, is still there. Um, she would also specify uh, uh, that the Tower of Letters publishing project does have one point of intersection with the state which is when it actually gets physically printed. So she tries not to have it overseen in terms of content selection or production um, by uh, state facilities, um, but she wants artists and writers to be in charge of the selection. And with translations, she wants translations executed by creative writers because she feels um, there are too many translations that are executed without proper attention to the, the literary qualities of the work um, at this point in Cuba. She's in central Havana, and the community she talks about is uh, a more working class community than um, uh, some other writers. She also, these are some of the younger writers I will refer to in passing tomorrow in my talk. She connects um, uh, people who come to visit her home with young writers now to try to create um, new opportunities for them. So earlier today, I was talking with one of the classes about um, a book called Catch and Release, where the metaphor of fishing, catching and releasing a fish is a metaphor for her for poetry and um, sort of capturing something and letting it go. There's a lot of maritime imagery in this book, and this is one of those pieces. Fisherman, rough. It's not laudan and they'll pull out of the ochreous depths of your patience waiting on the wall. Deeper, much deeper at the bottom, the thought decomposes and breaks apart. Fish corpses, shadows of lights that once marked ship's profiles, shackles forged from the imagination reduced by the wild coast to the wretchedness of pollution, not being anything anymore, scrap iron for scavengers. I watch for movement in the nylon line because I want to recover sunken history. And so I see them haul out something changeable, the fishermen riding the wall like horsemen, their heavy grief afloat. But life doesn't come floating past a second time in its boat, and there hasn't been enough fishing to navigate this dead calm that deceives us by lapsing into storms. When the afternoon vacates the vision you were creating of it over the faces of those fishermen in their work brown shirts, reminding us they can't fish out a wild and special something with a skin that was shine in the sun. Uh, this is from a book called Other Letters to Milena. This was completed in the 1990s. The Milena she's addressing is partly the European writer, Milena Yezinska, who's Czech. She was the only writer that Franz Kafka fell in love with and he exchanged letters with Milena. And that is one of the international touchstones of this book. Reina integrates references to everyday life in Havana with often these international um, touchstones and moves back and forth between them. The other millennials, her daughter, 
This is Elise Molina. Elise was a child in the, the special period crisis. And this book is uh, actually one that Raina doesn't like to read from because it puts her back into a time and a place psychically that is too hard to inhabit while she's trying to focus on her current work, her current projects. She doesn't want to read from this book. So here I am, I'm going to take this opportunity while she's not here. <laughs> but because I think the reason that she does not read from this book makes it all that more important for us to look at it. Um, it is a very deeply meaningful and personal book, even as it's very intellectual. And I, I occasionally call her merciless. I think this is a merciless book. Now, the first piece that I'm going to read, um, possibly the, the only one, we'll see how this works out. Um, but it's called Passage of Clouds, and it is dated to the 18th of September in 1994. In the few weeks leading up to that, over 30,000 Cuban rafters were picked up by the Coast Guard. Um, this was a period of profoundly intense immigration. And so even though you'll see she has these international and classical references in the poem, um, they are very much tied to what was at this point a very pressing crisis. Um, some of the images that people may have seen in Cuba. It's very beautiful. Paso de Nubes is what this is called. Arca de Nue, embarcación grande en que se salvaron del diluvio, Noé y su familia. Y cierto número de animales, caja de madera, depósito para recibir el agua, depósito en que se guardaban las tablas de la ley, cajón o sitio donde se encierran varias cosas. Aquí también se, encier se encierran varias cosas, destinos, posibilidades, templos y palacios, columnas y obeliscos, pirámides y sigurad movidos, hacia el agua, bautizos, iconografías, otra plástica de voto, como en antiguo arte, más allá de la isla de Argos. Los movimientos parecen torpes, los relieves que cubrían la realidad o las paredes, un hombre semiaciente en medio de la arena, es también la estatua yaciente de un hombre mero. La pirámide es una pirámide de balsas, Una balsa trae una muñeca recostada a los remos. También hay un caballo que acecha desde la orilla si subirá o no esta vez la marea. Él los ve alejarse, aumentando el tamaño y la dimensión de sus figuras, alejarse y perderse en el confín del horizonte. Los niños siempre han jugado a las balsas que se sobran y vuelven a flotar cuando el peso de las manos desaparece. Pero esta vez las balsas suben y se ocultan el brazo que pretende sujetarlas y una nube como si fuera a saltar toda el agua blanca de la espuma derramada se une al brazo del muchacho despidiéndolas. Algunas se hundirán para siempre entre la arena y la resaca. Otras tocarán el límite. Siempre sospecharemos cuál encayó, cuál regresó, la que habrá llegado. Es una isla con sus niños que han jugado a crecer con sus balsas. Mucha gente empujada con el agua hacia el pecho está rezando adentro. Veo los ojos de la niña, el tío vivo flotante donde van sus hermanos, la desolación. Se ha ido mi muñeca más querida también, y aquella balsa, atado del centro, con un viejo siempre de espaldas a mi cámara, no quiere volver los pies y despedirse. Es el abuelo. Balsas de madera, asfalto y poliespuma. Cristo delante de la caravana, un cuadro realista del sagrado corazón de Jesús como proa. O esta otra una cruz de palo con un mástil que pasa enfrentándose al vaivén del vacío del viento. Laterales de zinc y goma, caucho recalentado, un niño y una nube. Un caballo también que se aproxima y bebe un sol salobre. Han visto como todos los otros se van y se pierden detrás de un límite impreciso. 
passage of clouds, Noah's Ark, great embarkation in which Noah and his family and a certain number of animals were saved from the deluge, wooden box, receptacle for collecting water, receptacle for safeguarding tablets of the law, crate or space in which various things are enclosed. Here too various things are enclosed. Destinies, possibilities, temples and palaces, columns and obelisks, pyramids and ziggurat blurring towards choppy water, baptisms, iconographies, another art of a form as an ancient sculpture from beyond the island city of Argos. Their motion appears ungainly. Reliefs that fill reality were the walls, a man semi-reclining in the sand, a reclining statue of a Meroitic man. The pyramid is a pyramid of boats. One raft carries a doll leaning on the oars, and at the coastline, a horse waits to see whether the tide will rise or not this time. He sees them moving away into the distance, the size and dimension of their figures expanding as they get farther away, disappearing into the horizon's confine. The children have always played by rafts, which capsize on the surface as the weight of their hands pulls away. But this time, the rafts rise and evade the arm that attempts to restrain them. And as if all the white water were about to fly out in spilling foam, the cloud adheres to the arm of a boy seeing them off. Some boats will sink for good between the sand and the undertow. Others will touch up against the line of limitation. We'll always have our suspicions about the one that ran around, the one that came back, the one that made land. This is an island the children grew up playing with its rafts. Many people soaked up to the chest with water or praying on the island. I see the girl's eyes, the floating carousel where her brothers have gone, the desolation. My favorite doll is gone too. And that raft, shrouded at the center, with an old man whose back is always to my camera, who doesn't want to turn his feet to leave, it's the grandfather. Boats of wood, asphalt, and styrofoam. Christ at the front of the caravan, a realist painting of the sacred heart of Jesus at the bow. Or this other one, a cross made of sticks for a mast passed by, off to confront the rolling of the void in the wind. Sides of zinc and rubber, melted tire, a boy and a cloud, and a horse who approaches to drink from a brackish sun, have seen how all the others go off, lost behind some big boundary. So that's one of the longer ones I'll do. Um, I think when you have the bilingual readings, um, shorter pieces tend to work a little better. But it, you can see she's working across genres. You have something that looks on the page like a poem, indisputably. You have this, which is a rather dense um, prose poem, and then it moves into letters to her daughter, Elise, um, and, uh, and into essays. Again, diaspora is a theme. There are all kinds of different views on it. There's an essay about Agatha Badia, the a famous exiled writer in the back. But the heart of it is really Elise, and there was a moment when the writing the translation part of it intersected with the very real realities of diaspora because I went to work with Reina on it. And during my visit, I discovered Elise was actually preparing to leave. And that's very much what this book foretells um, in the text. So it became a kind of strangely embodied experience to translate it. And Elise is now living here. Um, in the United States. So Reina is more often spending time here as well, and her geography has become more complicated as a result. So, um. With Reina, she says that she very much writes for the page. She is not in any way a performance poet, according to her own definition, but you'll notice she's got her own charisma. She very much has a presence, even if it is a quieter one. Desde el polvo del muro, con su pesada flote. Pero a flote no veo otra vez 
en la vida en su barco y no se ha pescado suficiente para atravesar esta calma chicha que engaña con su lapso a la tempestad. Cuando la tarde se va a la tuición de hacerla contra el rostro de esos pescadores de camisa casi pardas, recordándonos y algo salvaje y especial, con pellejo lustroso al sol, no pescarán. So that was filmed uh, about a 10 minute walk from her house and it's a walk that she often does. I, I mentioned in a class earlier today that there are these um, combinations of global references with intertext from uh, around the world and this is one of the most recent ones. This is from her uh, book El Piano which came out just two years ago and uh, it's called Green and Blue. This is one of the pieces where I actually went and read Virginia Woolf's original text and it shows very different wording than I would have if I had tried to do it literally off of which means Spanish. So um, it's called Verde y Azul. And in Spanish it sounds like this, it's much shorter. Pacificando de nuevo estos verdes, aquellos azules y verdes de Virginia, tío vivo que renace con la memoria. Otra lancha, su espuma desigual. Los afilados dedos de cristal cuelgan hacia abajo, hacia la insensatez, hacia la intemperie. Desenfreno de querer cortar un límite, una apariencia por la que todo pasamos al final. Un horizonte como obediencia, no como destino. Esto fue la falsa de morir de una manera u otra, sin rumbo, aburridamente. Llamando la experiencia a la desesperación donde el verde suyo queda totalmente excluido. Green and blue. The whole story is called blue and green. Classifying these greens again, those blues and greens from Virginia, carousels that restart with the memory. Another motorboat, its wake uneven. The ported fingers of glass hang downwards, toward stupidity, toward exposure. Licentiousness of wanting to cut a boundary, an appearance, through which we all pass in the end. A horizon is obedience, not as destiny. This false proof of dying one way or another, without a course, monotonously, giving the name of experience to the desperation whose green has been swept completely out. So I'm going to move on to Angel Escobar. I'm just going to read one from this book. Um, it's called Breach of Trust, Aluso de Confianza. And Escobar was from um, Eastern Cuba. Uh, I think I'll read the one that is, it's not only short, this is very widely anthologized. Um, it's called Hospitales. And he did suffer from real illness. Um, but you'll, again, you'll see he's mediating the imagery he draws from the local scene with some international literary references. Um, I, I am another or I am somebody else is one of the famous um, uh, draws from Rambo. Hospitales. Yo vi a Rambo amarrado en una cama y a papá protagónico amarrándolo duro y su pijama soltándolo. Gritaban y se soltaron los huesitos vírgenes con doctores soplando el favor roto. Se, se quebraron los vasos, las persianas, los símbolos, y luego a cada cual según sus síntomas, eh, le entregaron su píldora, sus ojos, su cuaresma. Era el año bisiesto de estos días de marzo y vi cómo se abarcaba el chino en un perrusco. El chonchulí explotando su secado y él sentado mirando por arriba. Responsabilidad y culpa a los teléfonos a los viejos modales de los jueces y a sus hijos. Yo vi a Rambó descubriendo en una cesta de ojos bien templados y sanos como agujas. Lo vi. No me arrepiento. Estoy tranquilo. Soy el escriba, el buey que no ha tenido nada. Estoy tranquilo. You had Degree in theater, by all accounts, was very impressive when he when he read hospitals. I saw Rambo rope to a bed, and the Potter protagonist roping him down hard, and his pajamas letting him go. They roared, and the smallest innocent bones came loose with doctors blowing on that broken bassoon. The glasses shattered, and the blinds, and the symbols sent to each according to the symptom they gave his dose, his eyes, his Lenten discipline. 
It was March and leap year, and I saw the goat choking on a piece of rock. Big black bird, scapegoat exploiting his enclosure, and he sat there looking upwards, the responsibility and blame to the telephones, to the old ways of the judges and their children. I saw Rumbo spitting into a basket of eyes, well-tempered and wholesome as needles. I saw him. I do not repent. I am composed. I am the scribe, the ox, who is not only the thing. I am composed. And I'm going to finish with a short tribute to Juan Carlos Flores. So I don't really want to say much about this beforehand because the subject is difficult, but Juan Carlos um, passed away last month and um, it's disappointing not to be able to have him here to, to be with me. El Buso, this is kind of like the manifesto of the book, El Buso. Sea el buzo ocupación que se ejerce o propiedad horizontal, o hijo bobo de patria, o niño con biberón, área densa de pasto, hay los terrenos, terrenos baldíos, donde el vecindario peatonal arroja los escombros de sus vidas, y entre la mala hierba crece la seta, que es una nueva civilidad, sin incluirse aún en mapas de la contracultura. Sea el buzo, ocupación que se ejerce, o propiedad horizontal, o hijo todo de patria, o niño con biberón, áreas densas de pasto, a los terrenos baldíos, donde el vecindario peatonal arroja los escombros de sus vidas. Y entre la mala hierba crece la seta de una nueva civilidad, sin incluirse aún en mapas de la constructura. Sea el buzo, Ocupación que se ejerce, o propiedad horizontal, o hijo bobo de patria, o niño con biberón, a la hora señalada, cuando me llamen por mi nombre, no responderé. Both Escobar and Flores lived in the community of Olivar for at least part of their lives. Um, when Juan Carlos talks about horizontal property, he, we talk about this. This book is dedicated to the community of Alamar. And he's thinking specifically of those identical apartments in these identical, famously identical, repetitive five-story buildings um, in which people make their lives. And this book, as you may have just noticed, is characterized by the use of repetition, aesthetically speaking. Um, and he's uh, kind of a master of that repetition. It's fairly amazing um, how much variety he could work into that. This is a photograph I took of him. He was a uh, very intensely interested in visual arts, and um, we went together to the Fine Arts Museum, and he walked me around, and he would show me some new works each time, and he set up this photo when he knew I needed an author photograph for him. Uh, so this book has a lot of references, actually, to visual art. I'm going to show you a different kind of translation of Juan Carlos's work, because Juan Carlos is, of all three of them, the most performative poet of them all, right? And Although I didn't get to spend a lot of time with him on the ground in Alamar being at those performances, he talked to me about them. And so I'm going to try to give you a little bit of sense. These poems, not only do they function in a very sophisticated manner on the page and in reference to visual art, they are also scripts to be used for performance. And I know how he did this one sometimes, so I'm actually going to have you guys do one with me. And, you know, Juan Carlos will come out to these events in Havana, and he would just like, I'm up on the table. So here we go. Now, when I do this, you guys are going to say, smack. Okay? <laughs> we do that. I know we're at the University of Chicago. Uh, this is Chicago. also briefly, students, you need to know the Soviet Union of Fate. That's Fakio in fact. This poem. Here we go. Mea culpa for Tomas. Tomas. Kid from the Soviet Union, whom we call Bowling Pin Head, because he ate better than we did. Let's smack Bowling Pin Head because he dressed better than we did. Smack. No, 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 no. Because he dressed better than we did. Smack Bowling Pin Head because he had better toys 
than we did. Smack! Bowling pin head because he got better grades than we did. Smack! Bowling pin head so no girl could look at him. Smack! Bowling pin head next to Tomas. I think we all felt a little bit check. <laughs> house in Alamar, and we did not plan this, but he knew I was coming. And to just get a little bit of a sense of how good he was at performing, um, I'd like to play you what he called the famous, or not the famous, the most, um, uh, his favorite poem of this batch. It is fairly repetitive. I hear it's a dialogue with some French uh, prose poetry. But you can see, you'll notice he maneuvers within the camera screen. I didn't have to keep him there. Like he was very conscious of where he was and required virtually no direction to make this work. All right, so there are actually four poems from this book with Juan Carlos reading them in the original Spanish if anybody is interested in hearing them. He reads Tomas, but of course it's not a performed version, so you can actually hear his intonations, but you don't get to have the feeling of being in the actual space. Yeah. So this is inside his apartment in Alamar, where at that time he was living with Myra Lopez, who was uh, an essential collaborator in terms of technology. <laughs> La excavadora en la mina. Los mutilados de la guerra del mundo sienten nostalgia por la parte perdida. Al que perdió las piernas le faltarán para siempre las piernas. Al que perdió los brazos le faltarán para siempre los brazos. Al que perdió los ojos, le faltarán para siempre los ojos. Al que perdió los dientes, le faltarán para siempre los dientes. Cada cual recordando lo que hacía con su parte de menos. Al que perdió las piernas, le faltarán para siempre las piernas. Al que perdió los brazos, le faltarán para siempre los brazos. Al que perdió los ojos, le faltarán para siempre los ojos. Al que perdió los dientes, le faltarán para siempre los dientes. Y si juntásemos cada parte perdida, haríamos el inventario de la ausencia del hombre. All right, he also strung along that thing about reading under protest because he was hungry and then the reputation and variation on how to take home. So uh, I, I think as a, 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 a use of the original Spanish, it's very interesting. And Alomar uh, Juan Carlos knew people who had fought abroad and you know literally came back without parts of themselves, and he brought that up when he was telling me about this poem. It's called The Excavator in the Mind. Those mutilated in the wars of the world feel nostalgia for the lost parts. For the one who lost his legs, his legs will always be missing. For the one who lost his arms, his arms will always be missing. For the one who lost his eyes, his eyes will always be missing. For the one who lost his teeth, his teeth will always be missing. Each one remembering what he used to do with the part that's gone. For the one who lost his legs, his legs will always be missing. For the one who lost his arms, his arms will always be missing. The one who lost his eyes, his eyes will always be missing. For the one who lost his teeth, his teeth will always be missing. And if we put all the lost parts together, it would inventory the absence of man. Okay, I'm just going to do one or two in English because I think we're running a little short on time. But this one is entitled RMR. There are a lot of poems in here that have real people behind them, although Juan Carlos told me that he also distorted them quite a bit in order to fit what he wanted the poem to be. So he doesn't want to identify too many of these people by name. But this is clearly a reference to Reina 
Um, she does, for example, have a son named Edger. In order to go visit her, you have to climb up lots of stairs and go back down, and these are all incorporated into the poem. RMR. My biological mother died. The killer, three jabs, using an ice pick for jabbing cubes of ice, not by blood. Another woman is my mother. My love for her is an agapic love. I, who am called Juan, without really knowing why, now and then I call myself Edgar, cooked. The poems you write smash teeth. I've answered by shrugging my shoulders. I go up a stairway, my biological mother died. The killer, three jabs, using an ice pick for jabbing cubes of ice, not by blood. Another woman is my mother. My love for her is an agapic love. I, who called one, without really knowing why. Now and then I call myself Edgar, cook. The poems you write smash teeth. I've answered by shrugging my shoulders. I go down the stairway. Godmother, through this torn sock, God enters me, comes in through a paw or a foot. This is called Germany, 1843. After battling, that abject individual died peacefully, faced resting on the wood of the window frame, watching the snow fall and pile up over the same ground traveled by the gods. Circles never coming to a close, us. We go along wiping out our lifetimes, on some occasions external men, on others internal men. Never the man fine and exact, thus the precariousness of our gestures. Circles, never coming to a close. Someone at a more propitious moment, perhaps, may resolve this arduous issue. After battling, that abject individual died peacefully, face resting on the wood of the window frame, watching the snow fall and pile up over the same ground traveled by the gods. Thank you. I'm going to stop there.